Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the first lecture of NYC Audubon's 2023 to 2024 Winter Lecture Series. My name is Rosalind Rivas, and I am NYC Audubon's Public Programs Manager. Our, our Winter Lecture Series takes place every year from November to March. We invite five speakers of various backgrounds to give an online talk about their areas of expertise. Um, this year's theme is Narratives in Nature, in which we showcase speakers who highlight their identity in their work. For those who are not familiar with NYC Audubon and our work, we are a grassroots conservation nonprofit that works to protect wild birds and their habitat through conservation, education, uh, engagement, and advocacy. Our conservation work involves bird and biodiversity monitoring and various community science projects. Check out our conservation, conservation webpage for more info. I will drop it in the chat right here. So you can take a look. And if you're interested um, uh, in the legislative side of making NYC more bird friendly, you should learn more about our advocacy work. Also, we'll drop this chat right in right into the chat here. Some of NYC Audubon's advocacy priorities include passing the Lights Out Bill and supporting green infrastructure in New York City. Through engagement, we aim to foster an appreciation for birds and nature in the people of this city, inspiring them to take conservation action. In addition to lectures like these, we host hundreds of bird outings, classes, workshops, and festivals every year. Much of what you'll hear today by our speaker will come in handy, especially during bird outings. And so let me drop yet another link to our engagement page right here. All right. Also, you may have heard that we are changing our name, dropping Audubon to create a more inclusive and welcoming environment for all New Yorkers. We are working now to come up with a new name and expect to announce one in spring of 2024. Though our name will change, our work to protect birds and engage New Yorkers will not. For more information about the decision and the renaming process, and to submit suggestions for a new name, visit our website at the link I'll add to the chat now. A lot of links coming your way. So before moving on to our actual lecture tonight, some quick logistics. First, all lectures in the series will be recorded and later posted on our website for anyone to view. I've enabled closed captioning um, for the Zoom and the recording. We will be sharing the recording with everyone who registered later this week. And secondly, during tonight's lectures, please type any questions you have in the Q&A. You can open this Zoom feature by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We will take as many questions as we can after the presentation. Also, don't be shy to leave your comments um, in the chat. Um, actually, if you'd like, you can share with us uh, where you're uh, dialing in from. We'd love to know to see what's, uh, where you're calling in from. Um, and we also want to send a huge, huge thank you to Claude and Lucien Block, whose continued support has made this lecture series possible. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Joan Strassman, an award-winning teacher of animal behavior, first at Rice University in Houston, and then at Washington University in St. Louis, where she is Charles Reb Sock, professor of biology. Dr. Strassman has written more than 200 scientific articles of, on behavior, ecology, and evolution of social organisms. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and has held a Guggenheim Fellowship. She lives with her husband in St. Louis, Missouri. In her book, Slow Birding, The Art of Science and Enjoying the Birds in Your Own Backyard, which I have a copy of right here, uh, Joan Strassman tells colorful stories of the most common birds to be found in the country, ones that are often overlooked. This guide gives you a glimpse of the world of common everyday birds and their unique behaviors, as well as advice on what to look for when slow birding. I sometimes serve as a bird guide myself in NYC Audubon outings, and every time I lead a group, I get to practice in recognizing birds' behaviors, which greatly helps in identifying them. And if you are attending this Zoom, you have a chance to win a signed copy of Dr. Strassman's book yourself. 
So all participants attending tonight will be entered in this lottery just by logging into this Zoom. So no need to write your name um, in the chat or anything. Um, we will be giving away two copies tonight. So stick around to hear the winners at the end of the event. And without further ado, please welcome Dr. Joan Strassman. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's really uh, an honor to uh, speak with you about uh, my current passion, which is slow birding. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit of the stories in the book and then also uh, talk about the journey that, that brought me here. Uh, let's see. So you might wonder why someone like me would write a book called Slow Birding. Uh, you don't know enough possibly to wonder, but I actually worked on social wasps for many years and then on social microbes. So it might seem funny that I would work on a book about wasps, about birds. And the reason for that is that my birding writing doesn't come from my research, it comes from my teaching. One of the joys of being a professor is no matter how old you get, the students stay 18 to 22 and you get to interact with them and figure out how the next generation is doing. And if you're lucky, share something with them. And so that's what I did. Um, with my students back at Rice University. And so this is one of them. Now that slow birding idea just is a riff off uh, slow food. So probably a lot of you have heard about slow food. This is a movement started by Carlo Petrini in Italy in the, I think it was in the eighties. And it took off when they put a McDonald's right at the Spanish steps in Rome and people were outraged, you know, don't Italians have better foods than McDonald's? And their first protest took the form not of smashing down McDonald's, not of, you know, pouring ketchup everywhere or anything like that. Instead, they took the soft view, which was they ser simply served great plates of penne with tomato sauce to the to the the crowds and just to sort of demonstrate how good the food was and i just think that's kind of a wonderful approach so you might wonder what this really has to do with birds and I guess what it has to do with birds to me is that there's so much to learn simply by watching the local birds and seeing what they're doing and, and learning their behaviors. It's true that it's a lot of fun to fly off to another country and look at all the birds that are there and check them off your list or put them on eBird, um, that, that can be really gratifying too. But to me, there's just something special about really seeing what they do. So um, this watching local birds was um, something that I felt I could really share with my students. And I kind of call it uh, teaching outside of the box, teaching in a really different way, where instead of giving students something planned to do, you get them to really stretch their imaginations. So I took my springtime class and, and started them with the question of how do birds use time and space? So, so this was... I showed them the birds nesting on the Rice University campus. There were great-tailed grackles and northern mockingbirds and yellow-crowned night herons. And then I simply asked them, what do they do? How do they spend their time? Watch them, take freehand notes, none of this kind of lab notebook thing. And then I also asked them how it differed between the sexes. This was kind of a trick question because the yellow-crowned night herons and the mockingbirds, the sexes look the same, 
grackles, they're really different. So then I would have uh, be able to expose students who would say, you know, oh, well, that one's bringing the sticks home. So it must be the male. And I'm like, well, how do you know that? And the only behavior that I would uh, accept as indicating for sure which sex the birds were was I uh, allowed that when they mated, the male was on top. And uh, actually, they saw a surprising number of, of matings. So I had the students do this, and we they worked through the, the semester, first with this, but then my, my third question was just, what else would you not like to know? And so then they would they would focus on something. And, and these are, it was a really simple lab. It was simple for me. They would go out, we'd meet on Wednesdays. Often they would stay the whole period and not want to leave, just discussing what they'd seen. And then by the end, I had these students pick something that they could count that related to a hypothesis that they could test with a statistical test. So. Anyway, that's uh, what I did with this course for many years. And then I realized that really I, I wanted to share this with more people. And I, we, started, we started a blog that the students wrote in. And then uh, I talked about writing this book for about 20 years. And then a, a friend said, Joan, you keep talking about writing this book. You're never going to write it. Just let it go. Just just let it go. That was almost the inspiration to get me to write it. I had to frame it. I decided, well, if it's slow birding, it's local birding. I live in St. Louis. I lived in a lot of places, but right now I live in St. Louis. And I decided I would just pick a 20-mile circle from home and six birds, five places, and watch these birds and tell the amazing stories about these birds. So the first one in the book that I'll I'll tell you about is the the blue jay. And uh this is a wonderful bird. I love blue jays. Um, blue jays are a bird that we had in our, our home in Houston where they would take coins from our hand and then fly off, it was clearly a fledgling that had been uh, tamed somehow. Um, so I really liked that bird. My kids had it land on their little hands. It's a bird that uh, has had a big role of spreading the oak trees north. Um, and it's kind of the policeman of the skies. And even though it's a lovely bird, brilliant bird, it's not the state bird of any state. Not a single state has chosen the blue bird, the, the blue jay. So if you ever have a role in doing that. I hope you can uh, um, influence uh, maybe some state someday will have the blue jay as their as their state bird. So the next bird I'll talk to you about is probably the first bird that you and maybe your kids see in their daily lives. And that's the American Robin. And it's easy to see because they're on the ground, they hop around hunting for worms and, and uh, let us approach surprisingly closely. So they're, they're really fun. Um, they look like they're really uh, devoted parents with, with their kind of grass and mud nests often low enough that we can watch them and you'll see both parents work really hard to bring wor worms to the young. And uh, it, it just looks like a, a scene of uh, familial bliss and uh, franticness as they hunt for those worms. Well, it turns out that actually uh, mockingbird, uh, 
Did this just go backwards? I'm sorry. It turns out that, that robins actually have quite active, what you might call dating lives. And um, about half of the babies are sired by a male that is not the one caring for the nest. Um, so to figure this out, uh, Patrick Weatherhead, who's a Canadian, retired now back in Canada from Illinois, and his grad student, uh, Karen Rowe, use DNA markers just like those humans use um, looking for paternity or signing up on sites like 23andMe. So robins are also easy to, to watch. And you can, so another project that, that Montgomery and, um, and um, uh, Patrick Weatherhead did was try to figure out how they could find the worms. And they looked at whether they heard them, whether they felt the vibrations of the worms, whether they saw their movements and whether they smelled them and concluded that, that in fact, they heard the worms. So when you see a, a, a robin kind of tilting its head, listening for worms, yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. That's a kind of question that might occur to you, but here's one that certainly surprised me. And this is done by Bob Montgomery and his student, Felina English, who they had read a paper that said that another species that the males cared more for bluer eggs than for lighter blue eggs. And the argument was the really blue eggs indicated um, that the females had had this um, uh, chemical that is somewhat expensive to make. And so the females were in better condition, which meant that the, the chicks coming from those eggs would be better. And so the male then should invest more in them. Now, your first thought might be, well, that's backwards. Wouldn't you invest more in the weaker chicks and not the stronger chicks? I, I mean, that's certainly what we would do. Well, birds aren't like that. You have to think of it from the point of view of the bird. Odds are they're gonna lose all of their young and they themselves have a, also a high chance of dying. So if they want any chance of leaving young to the next generation, they tend to invest not in the weakest birds, but in the strongest. Well, so did this blue egg color have anything to do with, Bob Montgomery was skeptical. So what he did was robins are really common. So he was able to find a lot of nests and with all of the appropriate uh, permits, he and Felina English collected all of the eggs carefully right early when they were laid. They were able to find synchronous nests and they collected the eggs and brought them into an incubator. And as they collected them, they put darker blue um, plaster of Paris eggs in half the nests and lighter blue eggs in the other half. So this is like a perfectly controlled experiment because the eggs they're incubating are just plaster of Paris and all they differ in is, is their color. And so they put the eggs in the incubator and then this is why you have to know your species. A day before they hatched, they scrambled the eggs, not scrambled like you're thinking, but mix them all up and carefully put the real eggs back in all of the nests not the nest they came from, but any old nest. And so then they were able to watch the nests, which they did with cameras, and see whether the males cared more if they had been incubating darker blue plaster of Paris eggs. It's a really perfectly controlled experiment. And they found that in fact, for the first three days after the babies hatched, the males brought in about double the amount of food if they were if they were bluer and then fed you know fed less to the lighter blue so 3 days may not sound like much 
But for ro robin babies in the nest, it's really a crucial period. So they uh, supported the hypothesis that both bluer eggs are um, an indication of higher quality that males respond to. So I'd like to just tell you one more Robin story. And this one is uh, kind of a personal one. And that's one of the things that was really fun about writing this book was uh, that I know a lot of the researchers and they would just tell me their stories. So that was really fun. So there's a Brilliant scientist named Sarah Coker, who's uh, at uh, Princeton University, not far from you all. And she studies bees and I knew her well because I studied wasps. She was an undergrad at the University of Illinois. And uh, when I'm reading papers, I always look at the acknowledgement section. And uh, she mentioned that in the acknowledgements of this Robin paper, and she'd been an undergrad at Illinois, so here's just a quote on, on what she told me. American Robins. Yes, this was my first foray, foray into behavioral ecology. I took a class with Pat Weatherhead and realized how much I adored animal behavior. I signed up for a summer project with one of his graduate students, Karen Cavey, now Roe, and it literally changed my life. It was pretty typical birding field work, waking up at 4 a.m. to go out to our site, search for nests, set up cameras to record behaviors, miss net to capture birds, band them and draw blood for paternity analyses, and a field spec to measure the intensity of each bird's plumage color. Once I had finished that first cup of coffee, I genuinely loved every minute of it. It was because of Karen and her amazing mentorship that I realized that I really had a passion for studying animal behavior. And that summer was the first time I really started to seriously contemplate graduate school as a viable path forward. This study also happens to be how I met my partner, Julien. He came to the field site one day to bring Karen lunch. We started talking and I guess the rest is now ancient history. So yes, this project literally changed my life. How exciting to think that one day it may end up in a book written by you. Seems a wonderful way to close the loop. Um, so that was kind of cool. All right, here's, a, here's another bird from the book. It's a American coot. Coots are one of the commonest birds that you'll you'll ever see in uh, in water bodies all over the country there's also different kind of coot in in Europe you'll mostly see the adults and and not these brilliant little young here they've got a little identifying necklace on um my youngest son did a science fair project looking at uh coot group size with and without alligators nearby to see if they made uh, bigger groups when there were alligators nearby. I would think of them as a bird a child might draw with their black, but uh, then with a white bill. Um, but they're actually, they're not a duck. They're not a duck. They're a rail more closely related to chickens than to ducks. And they have green lobed feet. So these young look nothing like their parents and they have these really bright feathers that are that are so, so surprising. Uh, usually bright color is associated with uh, males attracting females with their color and their dances and things, but these are just little babies. Um, colors in babies are more likely to have something to do with um, predator protection. These guys, this is not protect, predator protection. And in fact, they know to hide their heads if, if a predator is nearby. So why are they so bright? Would parents care for bright babies more? So this is what Bruce Lyon, who's also a fabulous photographer and took this picture. He studied this for his, for his uh, PhD dissertation. He's, he's uh he worked in uh, far northern British Columbia, and he's he's a professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz and is now working on rosy finches 
on St. Paul Island, which is uh, north of the Aleutians, and it's a really remote place. So the first thing that Bruce did was think, well, what happens if they don't have those bright colors? So he trimmed the feathers of some young to see what would happen. Um, and the ones that he trimmed were not the oldest. It turns out coots have, have big broods. They have lots of babies. They start incubating before the last egg is laid, which means they don't all hatch out at the same time. And if he trimmed the feathers of a later baby, then the parents did not take care of it at all and just drove it off. And then the babies died. Now, that I'm sure sounds awful to you. And that how could you do an experiment where the babies die? And I'll, ju I'll just say that, yes, it is awful, but a lot of the coot babies die anyway. So he wasn't increasing the number of babies that died, just influencing which ones died. Okay, so the feathers mattered, but that still didn't tell him why they mattered. And so it turns out that in coots, there's a lot of egg dumping. So what egg dumping is, is females will go pop out eggs into other females' nests and just hope the other female will take care of them. Sometimes the females that do that are neighbors. Sometimes they're females that uh, haven't attracted a mate to help care for young. They've obviously all mated. And um, so this egg dumping happens later on in the order of laying of laying the eggs. And so it turns out that what this color pattern has to do with is the parent coots figuring out which babies are theirs by looking at the patterns of the colors. Um, so there's a lot of other cool things these coots do. So one thing is the first babies to hatch so, so coots eat vegetation. So the baby, the eggs hatch, the babies hop out of the nest, they're in the water, they're too young to get vegetation themselves. So the parents pick it for them and both parents take care of the oldest young. And then by about 10 days old, those chicks, they still stick around the parents, but they can fend for themselves for eating. And then the parents turn to the younger chicks and the way it happens is that the mother and the father each kind of adopt one of the younger chicks and mostly take care of that one. So anyway, it's just a fascinating set of, of behaviors. Um, it wasn't just Bruce Lyon that did this work. He had a really brilliant grad student who's now a professor in Nebraska, uh, Daisaburo Shizuki, and um, he figured out a lot of this stuff. So, all right, I hope you weren't worrying that you better leave because I'm just gonna talk about bird after bird and you might as well just read the book. I, I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory. So Anthony Bartley is, is the artist who drew the pictures in the book and um, here along the bottom are some of his other artwork. He's 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 currently based in Chicago, um, and so you might wonder how I how I got Anthony to do this. And I it's I don't know if it's an interesting story or not, but I I was determined to not use a known artist. I wanted to. You know, I guess it's the teacher in me. I wanted to give someone a chance who hadn't done this and who could then um, have have having illustrated my book help with his career or her. And so I knew Anthony already because he was also a biologist and he worked in my in my microbiology lab. And I I knew of his art and I I just love the the things he does. And I, I would never have presumed he would do something so different from 
what he normally does as draw birds. But one day he told me that that he was thinking of getting a medical illustration degree and that he was, you know, needing to find an additional way to support himself. So and then he ended up with a job in an ob Gin department here at Wash U. And I thought, wow, if you're going to draw that, maybe you'll draw some birds for me. And uh, he was happy to do it. He's he's great. So it's just been wonderful to work for him. So check out his webpage, uh, fadingroyalty.com. So that was kind of kind of fun. Here's just a few of his of his drawings. This is white throated sparrow, northern flicker, Cooper's hawk for the moment. It won't be for long. It's one of the birds that the American Ornithological so Society is going to change the name of. Blue Jay gets to keep its name. Um, well, so yes, I'm a teacher and uh, I love to, you know, share some of the tools that are out there. They're free. I'm sure you all know about this. Um, Merlin is just fantastic. Um, my lab has a little outreach booth once a month at the Ferguson, Missouri Farmer's Market. And so last month, uh, my husband and I were there. We had some pictures of birds, but what we were mostly doing is just helping people get Merlin on their phones and showing them how it worked. And it was just like so much fun to see such happy people. So yeah, Merlin isn't perfect, you know that, but it's it's pretty good and it's I really enjoy it. If you're good with your birds, eBird makes you part of the world community of uh, gathering data on birds. Some people say, oh, some people list the wrong bird, but overall eBird has been shown to be really fantastic for the uh, scientific value. And there's tons of tons of papers using eBirds. There's, uh, I go to the bird meetings and there's always workshops on how to, how to use eBird, just love it. Oh, people like to know things like, when do I write? This is my front yard at home. I live pretty urban part of St. Louis, but I do have a wild front yard. I have a, still a lot of students and uh, teach and all of that. So I'm not in a position where I can just say, okay, I'm writing from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Nobody can interrupt me. I just write whenever I get a scrap of time to do it. And I find that since I like what I'm reading and writing about, it's just not really a problem to not have a, a dedicated time to write. So I don't know how we're doing on time. If you want me to talk about a few more birds. We want snow geese. So I love snow geese. I think that uh, they connect me with the wild when I see them flying overhead in the spring. I know they're going farther north than I've ever been. And when I see them in the fall, I know they're going back to the uh, rice fields and coastal prairies of Texas where I where I used to live. Snow geese are like us, only more so in a lot of ways. Uh, first of all, they're very social. They're always in groups. And yet they're entirely monogamous, much more so than we are. They feed together, migrate together, nest in colonies, and mate for life and rear their young in pairs. You might say they're a better version of ourselves, but like us, you might say there's too many of them. They, are, they degrade their winter habitat isn't such a big deal, but they degrade their nesting habitats such that 
after snow geese have been nesting in an area for um, a few dozen years, the habitat becomes unusable to all um, Arctic coastal nesting birds. They they just simply trod on on all the vegetation. They eat everything, and it it just becomes um, unusable. So the one of the best studies of snow geese was by uh, Fred Cook and his team, and it was at La Perouse Bay, which is um, off the St. James, the northern edge of the St. James Bay, sort of farther south than they than they usually nest. So there's no grasses left. It's all churned up and uh, they don't nest in that area. And this isn't the only place where they've moved. So they nest in an area for a while, degrade it, and then, and then move on. Well, what are we doing about them? Um, people have studied them. I, I saw on Facebook one time that one of my friends was like talking about cooking snow geese and stuff. And it was in the spring and I was completely horrified. I mean, I'm not a hunter, but I I think that uh, hunters of snow geese certainly serve a really important role. And that is that, that you can hunt snow geese in the spring. It's, it's an effort to control their numbers. It's not a terribly successful effort, but it's it, it was very interesting to me to discover this. There's another reason that uh, it might be surprising that uh, snow geese are so common, and that is because they're sick. They have a kind of avian cholera, and I don't know why they call it cholera, because the virus is not related to cholera. The symptoms are not related to, to the kind of cholera we get. I don't know why. It's a virus. It's called cholera, whatever. Anyway, it kills as many as 30% of the snow geese a year. I mean, can you imagine if we had a pandemic that killed that many people every year? year and then it's just how it is and you go on with it. Um, it's just kind of uh, kind of unimaginable. So there's another story about snow geese that that uh, I really like. And it turns out that there's actually another form of snow geese and they're the the blue geese. And they're the same species. They're not different, but they they have originally, they nested in a different place. So the way snow geese work is they find their mates for life on their wintering grounds in the South, Texas, Louisiana, other places. And, and then they have the, the challenge of, well, where do we go to breed? You're from here, I'm from there. It's the the female, they follow the female, so they go to wherever the female came from. So here's just a little excerpt from the book on these blue geese, and it's about a Canadian adventurer and ornithologist called Dewey Soper, who's um, kind of made it his life's mission to figure out where the blue geese nested. We all take on our own challenges for reasons known or unknown, even to ourselves. And these challenges enrich our lives. For a famous ornithologist, J. Dewey Soper, the personal challenge was to find the breeding grounds of the blue goose. Soper was born on May 5th, 1893, day different from my birthday, although I was born in a different year, near Rockwood, Ontario. He went to Alberta College and then the University of Alberta. Thoreau's Walden inspired him, The Soper yearned for true wilderness, northern wilderness. Through naturalist connections, Soper managed to get a position as a naturalist on a number of Canadian uh, explorations. His official tasks involved Arctic plants and animals, but his passion was blue geese. He wanted to discover where they nested. Like many discoveries by Europeans and their descendants, Discovering meant connecting with the right native people who knew all along where something was. 
And so it was with Soper. An Inuit named Salia drew a map from memory that pointed to Bowman Bay. By mid-May, Soper and five Inuit and 42 dogs pulling sledges crossed to Bowman Bay. On June 2nd, one flock of blue geese flew over, and by June 6th, thousands appeared. Um, so these blue geese used to be slightly farther east and more in Louisiana than uh, the white geese, which were more in Texas. And uh, on the East Coast, there's a, also a white, the white form is a slightly larger one. So anyway, um, I'll just quickly tell you about this bird. It's a white-throated sparrow. It's a bird that uh, Audubon got wrong. He thought that this white-throated one was the male and this one was the female. That's not the case. It turns out there's a chromosomal inversion that causes these two forms. It's on the second set of chromosomes and not to go into a lot of uh, detail, but basically what this means is that white-throated sparrows have four sexes and you have to, so white male has to pick to mate with and have successful eggs, a tan female and a tan male could pick either a white or a tan female but the because this is sort of the more wild type but if and so then there's behavior differences so these white males they're kind of philanderers they're aggressive they don't take care of their babies very well they grab the best territories um so if these tan guys mated with a tan female they would be vulnerable to to having these white guys come in and uh, mate with her. So they each mate with a different color pattern. It's four sexes. There's an awful lot known about them and lots of great stories about these birds. And uh, these are just, just a few of the birds in the book and I hope you enjoy them. I have another, I have two more books. I have a journal coming out in about a year, which has pages for people to draw and write on based on slow birding. And next year, I, uh, I'm i busy now writing a book called Social Lives of Birds. So here's my contact. Um, it's really been fun talking to you all. And I hope you've uh, enjoyed some of these stories about birds. Thank you. much dr jones stressman that was so cool it was i myself am i super interested in animal behavior so um i loved hearing stories about um species and individual um animals um so right now we are going to open it up to q and a um so like i mentioned earlier there is a q and a function on zoom you can enter your questions there and i know we have a couple already all right, so I will uh, start with the first one. So Jean Gazitz asks, in another talk I've seen, I, it was said that mother birds and chicks can identify each other by smell. How would using an incubator and mixing the eggs from different nests affect that? I believe that was from the Robin uh, experiment that prompted the question. So that was with, with the blue colors. Yes. So... Smell is a really interesting topic about birds because people originally thought birds couldn't really smell. Turns out they can, and they have a, a gland where they uh, produce uh, preen oil and then bacteria grow there. And so the smell is sort of a rich mixture of their own products and the bacteria that grow there, which is actually not that different from humans. Um, so I am not familiar with birds identifying each other by smell. Um, birds often have both multiple ways to identify each other. 
and only identify each other when they're likely to be mixed. So fledglings are much more likely to have an identification system than nestlings, since nestlings are not usually mixed together. Um, they're unlikely to have to to be able to tell them apart. But maybe you heard a specific story I don't know about, and I, yeah, that'd be cool. Thanks for that. Um, we have another question. Is there a concern about zoonosis if people are eating snow geese? Uh, so the snow geese people catch are generally not sick. And um, I think this particular avian cholera is not catching to humans. And that's the main disease they have. I think anytime we interact with with wild animals, as we know to our dismay, um, yeah, there's a concern about zoonoses. I wouldn't eat them raw. I mean, I I I'd cook them well, and I'd probably wash my hands after handling them. I don't know. I'm not I'm not a hunter, but yeah. So yeah, I definitely like things well done, <laughs> not rare. But um, oh, this is a great question. Uh, could you give an example of a winter slow birding uh, journaling activity? I know your book is filled with them um, for an each chapter for every bird. Um, do you have one to share with the group? So one of the things I'm really enjoying right now is, is forcing me to get up early. I didn't change my my alarm with uh, with uh, standard time is the birds are root, the blackbirds, crows and, you know, rusty blackbirds, red wings and all, they're roosting and robins, actually, they're roosting and here they're roosting somewhere east of me. And I just love to to get up and, and watch them. They, they just fly over and they go out to forage in the fields farther away from here. So I, I love to to just watch those birds and I need to find where they're roosting. I found an old reference to flocks of 20 million crows nesting, this is like a hundred years ago on islands in the Mississippi. So another thing that's fun to watch is there's a, you know, sort of desiccated fruit trees and we have lots of cedar wax wings here that are in those trees and, and harvesting them. Um, there's lots of feeder activities. Um, you can, uh, in the chapter on the on the white-throated sparrows, there's also winter work where they would put out a square of um, seed on the ground and then just watch the birds interact to, to eat the seeds. Yeah, so um, as far as whether I'd worked with Anthony again, of course I'm working with Anthony again. So of course he's illustrating my next book and yeah, he's, he's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Anthony. I, I love those illustrations in and on the cover and inside the book. They're great. Yeah. Um, they're they're okay. changing the name of the Cooper's Hawk. The American Ornithological Society in a, uh, important decision, I think just last week, decided that for issues of, you know, racism, slaveholding, uh, horrible behaviors, that they would simply change the names of all birds named for people. So they wouldn't sort of try to second guess exactly who the most evil people were and change just those names they're changing all the names of birds that are named after people who, yeah, so Cooper's Hawk is is one of them. And uh, anyway, that's going to be rolling out. I'm for it. I think that it's a good idea to do it all, all at once and just get it over with. And this is the common names. The scientific names have very different rules. And this also only impacts the US where we use common names a lot. In other countries, they often tend to use the, to use the scientific names. Yeah. And um, 
Right. We, uh, NYC Audubon has uh, posted about that on our Instagram as well. Um, and for similar reasons, is uh, it's one of the reasons why we are um, changing our name, uh, NYC Audubon. I'll uh, put that link in the chat again if you want to hear more about that, um, uh, about the decision of why we're dropping the Audubon from our name. Um, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Joan. And I have another question here. Do you have a bird watching routine, like a favorite uh, day of the week, time of day, or patch? So I have a little dog and I take him out every morning and I try to get out early enough to see those birds flying over. It's a local park. It's a city park, two blocks from the house, you know, the kind with an elementary school and tennis courts. And it's only a couple acres. And I see all my dog walking friends and I watch, I watch those birds. I do like to get out to, uh, more exciting places. We have Forest Park here in, in town and other places, but yeah, I just love the birds. Yeah. I know we have a couple more questions, but we are um, reaching the end of our time. Um, but I'm sure, Joan, you would love to answer them at some other point. I know you've shared your information. Um, if, you, if you like, you can put it in the chat so people can uh, also see there. But I'll just uh, give some uh, closing remarks for tonight uh, because we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, but I haven't forgotten our raffle. So as I said in the beginning, we have two people who are lucky uh, winners to uh, get a signed copy of the book. So I'm spinning a name wheel now, seeing who it is. And... Oh, it is Kathleen McCarthy. Uh, thank you so much if you're still here. Yes, we will. Um, uh, I'll reach out to you separately uh, for um, uh, to send you that book. And then our next winner is, we'll spin the wheel again. It is Joan Ludendowski, thanks so much. Um, just your presence was enough to enter your names in here. I hope you're excited to get that those books. I will um, reach out to you both um, after this uh, talk is over. All right, so um, uh, if you'd like to apply any of the tips you've learned today outside when you're out birding, Check out the tons of bird outings that we have on our calendar. I'm going to drop the link to our calendar right here. Um, we are close to wrapping up the fall season of, of programs, and, but registration will be open um, for the winter programs that start in January. Uh, registration will open next month. So uh, you can check our website for more details on that. And one particularly exciting birding opportunity um, coming up is the annual Christmas bird count uh, taking place on se December 17th. Um, now it's in its uh, 124th year. This community science project is open to all. Kids welcome, families welcome. Um, participants take part all over the Western hemisphere collectively counting and recording birds in their areas. I participated in three CBCs so far and they're always so much fun. I get to uh, meet so many great birders and have a great time. Um, for more info and to register for the counts, NYC Audubon is coordinating. You can visit this link that I am putting in the chat right now. I get again. And if you liked this lecture, don't forget to join us next month for the second installment of the series, Birding as Therapy for the Chronically Ill with Bob Bell on December 5th. I'll drop one last link for you down here. You can register whenever you have a moment. All right. And with that, thank you again, Dr. Sussman, for speaking with us. This is so interesting, so informative, so lovely. Um, I loved hearing your stories, and I'm sure we all did too. Love seeing it in the chat. Um, and I thank you all for joining us tonight and have a great night. Uh, we'll see, hope to see you next time. All right. See you later. <laughs>